Um, right, thank you very much, Ed. Just to, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Kenneth Aitchison. My company is Landwood Research Limited. We do quite a lot of work looking at skills issues. We're particularly interested in issues relating to capacity, finding out about organisations and sectors, what they have and then what they need about building capacity. We do work in, on, in archaeology, but in uh, broader cultural heritage as well. Okay, thinking about those things, thinking about why it is important to be thinking about what skills people have, thinking about why it is important, why the potentially dull statistics I'm about to show you are in fact important, <coughs> is the idea that we, and I, I'm very strong adherer, believer to the, to the principles set out by UN Development Programme, thinking about building capacity. To build capacity for a sector or for a country or for a group or for an organization, there is a real process that it's really about, first of all, it's identifying what capacity you already have, measure the capacity that there is just now, then design a plan to improve capacity in whatever sense this might be, deliver that plan, and then measure again to see where you are afterwards. So a lot of what we do is at the measuring capacity end, but we're not exclusively about measuring capacity, but we are very interested in measuring capacity and develop methodologies that have been applied in, first and foremost in archaeology, but in other sectors as well, to measure the capacity of the sector. And measuring capacity is not just about headcounts. Headcounts is useful, but it, capacity, capacity is about, actually about what those people can do. And a brief pedant's, pedant's point, this is not a presentation about skills gaps, as it has been previously advertised. A skills gap is very specifically a phrase that I would use to describe something an organisation doesn't have something that the staff of an organisation don't have but need. A skills shortage is something different. A skills shortage is when, it is, when it's something that a, an organisation can't get in, can't, doesn't have the people to do that. Skills gaps are addressed by, historically, skills gaps are addressed by training the people you have and a skills shortage by bringing in new people. And that might be by hiring new people, or it might be by getting in outsiders, subcontractors. So that's why this presentation, its title was about skills issues rather than skills gaps. Skills issues incorporating skills gaps, of course. Right, pedant point aside. Thinking now about archaeology and the data that we, that we have. Archaeology, Live Market Intelligence, Profiling Profession 2012-13. This is actually the fourth in a series of exercises that were about getting snapshot pictures of who was working in professional archaeology. And so these have been undertaken at five-year intervals going back to 97, 98. And this is the cover of the most recent, most recent uh, edition. This has been about getting information on how many people work in archaeology. Sure, there is a headcount element to it. But for today's purposes, it's much more about thinking about skills issues. And for today's purposes, we're thinking much more about information technology and data management skills issues. Okay. Across this survey, which where we basically tried to contact every employer or potential employer of archaeologists in the UK, we asked the employers about their skills issues. Now this is this is methodologically quite important because we're leaving a lot of decisions down to the employers, to the people running the businesses. Sometimes these people either they can't see the water they're swimming in, they can't see the problems that are so close to them, or they choose not to report them. But we just have to accept this as being the best possible data sets we can get. So we presented them with a range of 
skills areas. A lot of them were quite technical and quite archaeological, and a set of them were more about generic transferable professional skills. And we asked them, we asked them about whether they had what kind of issues they were having with these skills. Are you having to train your staff? Are you having to bring in subcontractors? Okay. Have you lost skills in this area in the last year, last five years? So, issues then get flagged up in the report as being significant. If more than 25% of res respondents said, yep, we've, uh, we have to train people in this area. See, there, there's a thing. Saying that we will train people in an area actually flags it up as an issue because clearly they need those skills. It's a skills gap. And serious if more than 50% of respondents said this is going on. Difficult to break it down, really, because we've spoken to, we tried to speak to every archaeological employer in the land. That includes contractors, consultants, museums, arch university archaeology departments. So it's a wide range of organisations. In terms of IT, which was just, and now, of course, this is set at such a high, ungranulated level of IT skills. Do you train your people in IT skills? Do you need to get in some with IT skills? We couldn't really break it down more specifically than that. Yeah, it's a skills gap. A third of organisations want to train their staff to improve up in-house IT skills, and a quarter of them have to buy in outside skills. We also asked about data management which was reported as being not quite such a skills gap and certainly not quite such a skill shortage. People weren't being bought in to do the data management. But remember that this is trying to speak to every single archaeological employer in the land. And so some of them might not be thinking about data management in the way that this room thinks about data management. The change over time figures, I think, are very interesting. Now, we didn't ask about data management in previous iterations of the, the survey. We did five years ago and we did ten years ago. The skills gap, the proportion of organisations reporting a skills gap, so that means they need to train their staff in information technology or ICT, has been falling over the, these ten years. So it is, it is still a pretty big deal. But it is not such an, a horrendous, overwhelming deal as it was 10 years ago. I think that is a, an interesting point that you may wish to discuss further. And the same goes for skills shortages. 10 years ago, two thirds of firms were having to buy people in to do their, their IT for them. Not so much now. To put this in more in context, Here's another sector that I've done a very similar exercise for, uh, uh, the conservation. And this is conservation in the sense of the work of conservators, people um, treating individual portable pieces of heritage or art, and thinking about their IT issues. They're, they have a different set of, of problems. These are not just problems about knowing how to use information technology. They, they are reporting problems in how to conserve digital material, which I think is interesting. These are serious skills gaps. They, they, they have problems about um, interventive conservation, actually getting to grips with material and trying to conserve digital material. Preventive conservation, setting, setting up an environment so that the material will not need so much interventive work, and scientific or analytical services. Conserving digital material is a big issue. They also, like uh, in archaeology, have skills gaps in just the professional skills of IT. So that this is about people, people working for organisations providing conservation, have IT skills issues. Conservation is a different world from archaeology. It really is. The conservators are, I can confidently say, more technologically averse than are the archaeological community. The Conservation Register, which is an online list of um, 
businesses providing professional conservation services that are run by accredited conservators. A bit like the IFA registered organizations list. There. Earlier this year, 241 practices, three quarters of them don't even have their own websites. I think this is, sorry Doug, I keep walking away from the film. All of the, this, this is a sector that doesn't actually, doesn't even engage with IT on such a basic level. And the idea then about thinking about all their other IT and data management issues is uh, just compounded out of that. For comparison, I think there were 71 organizations on the IFA uh, register when I looked at this, and 70 of them had their own websites. And the one that didn't was uh, Essex CC Field Unit because it was in the process of closing down and becoming part of UCL Unit, Archaeology Southeast. So, conservation has a different attitude. And again, comparing across broader sector, this is a different report that I contributed towards that was basically written by TBR for creative and cultural skills were the primary client, but English Heritage were also a client. And this was, this was looking at skills issues across broader cultural heritage. This is not just about archaeology or conservation, but this is about historic buildings, this is about museums, this is about running visitor attractions. And a little bit, at a late stage, it changed from being called skills needs in cultural heritage to being about historic environment and cultural heritage. And IT and digital skills were being flagged up in that across the broad range of cultural heritage. Um, the, for archaeology, there they identified that 10% of organizations thought that skills were lacking among new entrants to the sector, which was interesting. 10% is less than the 13% that, have, that was reported across the whole of, of cultural heritage. And IT and technical support, the things were phrased differently. So that's thinking that there were skills gaps, skills issues there. But this report, this report, this report was written for creative and cultural skills. This report is written in a particular language that suits that client. When this report thought about IT and digital issues, it was this was very specifically the kind of areas they were talking about being problems. They, their IT issues were about social media, web optimization, website management, design. These were about the outward facing aspects of IT. This was not, they, they weren't flagging up the issues about running a business and data management. That is a, there's your perception across broader cultural heritage about what IT issues are. For a lot of these people, the kind of things that we spoke about in the first session would just be alien. So, just to think, just to the last couple of slides that are really, I don't know how much I have to say about things, but these are about helping provoke your, your discussions. Training in the past, thinking about how did we and how did those that went before us get our training? This comes back to the, the ongoing and traditional question, the paradigm that says commercial archaeology doesn't think the universities are training their, their students appropriately to become graduates that can work for them, and the universities don't think it's their job to, give the, to train people in these technical issues, the university think it is their job to train people to be able to think and understand and analytically understand human life in the past. It is to gain transferable skills through the, through the medium of a degree in archaeology, to gain life skills. But really it's about thinking about human life in the past. This has been the model for, for training in the past, and this has not been a model that has well suited incorporating IT and data management skills into the skill sets that people have when they enter the workforce. And then thinking about the future, I would like to think that in a lovely, wonderful world where we think more on the concepts of, let's not just think about training, think about human capital. Human capital is more than just a trained person. 
this is a, comes back to issues about capacity and an organization having capacity to do things, being things that are within its reach. Not quite the same as capability. We can't do any more of, of this. It's about being able to do. And building capacity through building capital, the idea, I like the idea that it is much more a responsibility for individuals. It is the responsibility of an individual to build their own personal capital, to build their own skills, uh, to, to be very economic about this. The more they build their skills, the better they are able to go out into the world and make their way in the world, and to make their way is to make their financial way in the world, to have the skills that get them the jobs that they want. This job that you want doesn't necessarily mean it's the highest paying job, it's the job that you want for whatever reasons, and you need the skills for that job. So, in terms of thinking about gaining cap capacity, organizations and individuals, I think, should in the future be thinking about focusing on building what individuals are able to do rather than a focus on the traditional it's not about traditionally it's not about what they do it's about the training course they have done to focus on the the other way around to focus on what people can do i think is the way that the sector every sector should be thinking and with that i thank you